in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord our Redeemer be with you. The Lord bless you. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. Dear friend, I just want to welcome you all this morning to our online service. This is St. John's online service, which is pre-recorded for 28th of February 2021. As you know that we are already in our second week of Lent and I hope you have got yourself into a reflective attitude. And I hope this service helps you move on further in this reflective season. Our dear friend uh, Barry, um, our vicar, will later on bring the word of God in the service. So as we begin our service, let's come together, open our hearts, confess our sin, and prepare ourselves to worship our Lord. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. So let us come to the Lord, who is full of compassion, and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. Cast your burden upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Give us the joy of your saving help again, and sustain us with your life-giving Spirit. So we pray together. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. May Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring you his pardon and peace, now and forever. Amen. So now let's pray. Almighty God, by the prayer and discipline of Lent, may we enter into the mystery of Christ's sufferings and by following in his way, come to share in his glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we will have our readings. And after our readings, Barry will be speaking from the word of God. A reading from the letter of the Apostle Paul to the Romans, chapter 4, verses 13 to the end. For the promise that Abraham would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. 
For this reason, it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, Abraham believed that he would become the father of many nations. According to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. Abraham did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made Abraham waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what God had promised. Therefore, Abraham's faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory, Glory to, to you, O Lord. Lord. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering 
and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May I speak in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The text I want to look at this morning is this one from Mark 8, where Jesus says to the crowd and to his disciples, if any want to become, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. And then he says, for those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. But what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? I want you just to think for a moment about what your attitude is to suffering. We tend to think of suffering um, as an evil, something that should not be. And according to God's overall intent for us, I'm sure that's right. In terms of his loving intentions, what he wants for us, I'm sure he doesn't want us to suffer for its own sake. But in the world we live in, suffering is actually a nuanced thing. It can bring about much good. An athlete will suffer in their training and in their competition. But in the course of that, they will achieve great things. A student may suffer many hours of hard study, may undergo something that they find something really quite challenging, not very enjoyable at all, but eventually aspire to great heights. Individuals through history have often suffered persecution, abuse, opposition, deprivation, but in the course of their suffering, they have changed the world. And in our own lives, in my life, certainly, the hardest times are sometimes the most fruitful. In the desert time or in the time of suffering, we have the opportunity to grow, to ask questions of ourselves, to learn to depend on God more, to learn trust, and also to become more resilient and discover deeper virtues that perhaps we didn't know we had. For Jesus to teach that he was going to suffer and die in the context of the passage I've just read was something that they were not ready to hear. It went against all the religious instincts of his hearers, even his good friend Peter. The inevitability of suffering may have been an inevitable thing in their lives, they would have seen it all around them, but it wasn't part of the tapestry that had been woven around the Jewish picture of Messiah. So this just wasn't whom Jesus was supposed to be in their eyes. Messiah was a picture of a Jewish king from a Davidic line who was expected to save and restore the Jewish nation, to be anointed with holy oil and rule the Jewish people in a messianic age. He was a saviour, a victorious redeemer, who would appear at the end of days and usher in what? Well, the kingdom of God the restoration of Israel, or whatever you thought was the ideal state of the world. 
That's who the Messiah was. The term Messiah, or Christ in Greek, means the anointed one. The picture is victorious, it's triumphant and final. And in it there is no room for the Messiah suffering or dying. It just doesn't fit with that picture. And yet Jesus says, if you want to follow me, follow my pattern and deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Plainly, if you are a Christian person, a disciple, a follower of Jesus, then Jesus, in some sense, asks you to take up your cross and follow him. And in Lent, we can't avoid verses like that. That's part of the focus. It's part of the meditation to think about what God is asking us to do and at what cost. So what does it mean for you and me to take up our cross and follow Jesus? Well, I can't give a general answer that would be right for everyone. But I focus on two aspects of this. The first one is obedience. In Philippians 2, Paul writes, Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. As we approach Holy Week in a few weeks time, we will read of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, anguishing over this obedience, counting the cost and actually asking God, his father, to take it away, but saying, not my will, but yours be done. And taking up your cross daily and following Jesus means to say, not my will, but yours be done. And to preface and suffix almost every prayer with those words, to say, not my will, but yours be done. And at its most basic level, taking up your cross and following Jesus metaphorically simply means doing what God has asked you to do. When Jonah finally relented and gave in and went to Nineveh, in a way, he took up his cross. He did what God wanted him to do, not what he wanted to do himself. When Paul was converted and obeyed Jesus in proclaiming the gospel to all the known world, he relinquished his old life, all his privileges and his power, and he took up his cross. Taking up your cross simply means being aware of God's calling on your life, whatever that is, and it is different for all of us, and being faithful to it, saying yes. It will bring great benefits, it will bring great joy, but it will also bring cost, and it may bring some suffering. That may not mean martyrdom or death in the literal sense, but saying yes to God often brings a cost. So the second aspect of this is the aspect of suffering itself. Can it be that being an authentic follower of Jesus will cause me to suffer? Well, clearly in some parts of the world, it most certainly does mean that. Uh, I could list a whole series of places all around the world where being a Christian would mean losing your job, losing your family, losing your home, or losing your life. There are places today where that is literally true. But it's not really true here, is it? It's not really true in Harrow, or in Britain, or in anywhere in Europe, and many other places. So does that mean that suffering will not come our way? Jesus suffered because he was going to die. He um, died a violent death. But taking up your cross doesn't mean to say you're going to be a martyr, not literally. But I want to suggest it will probably cost you something if it is authentic. Christians, the church, individually and collectively, 
are called by Jesus the light of the world. He calls himself that, but he also says that to his disciples as well. And the world does not always like the light. In John 3, Jesus says light has come into the world, he meant himself, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. I think Ajay preached on this a few weeks ago. If you stand up for Jesus, then you will be a light in the world, but not everyone likes the light. You will be asked sometimes to stand up for things. And if you stand up for something, that usually means there is someone who will resist you and you may suffer in some way. Standing up for things does not always get applause. It may get opposition. If you follow Jesus, he'll ask you to campaign for justice, to care about those around the world who suffer injustice. And if there is an injustice, there is usually, almost always, a vested interest somewhere in human society which will oppose you. So campaigning for justice can bring suffering. You're called, if you follow Jesus, to have certain standards in conduct, in language, in attitude, in what you do with your possessions, in your priorities and your values. And people who disagree with you may regard you as judgmental. They may even see you as their opponent, even though you don't mean to, to be. It will be uncomfortable. So following Jesus has a cost. And if you follow Jesus, you're asked to be generous and to give. And that exposes other people's meanness and they won't like it. You may be asked to include and welcome someone who is isolated and who may not be all that lovable. And those who don't do that often feel condemned by it and defensive about it. And instead of applauding you, may defend themselves at your expense. That suffering is built into human nature. If someone does good, sometimes the rest of us feel accused or in some way not so good. Though the enlightened world, the enlightened response would be simply to join in, all too often we get defensive and critical and the person doing good then suffers. And you'll see that pattern through all of history, all the martyrs, all the saints, all the great reformers in history suffered for their work. Doers of good often crashed headlong into those who did evil. And yet that's what God asks us to do. It's what Jesus asks us to do, to take up your cross and follow him. And Lent is a great time just to reflect on what that can mean. Firstly, to ask God what he is asking you to do. You can't obey him if you don't believe he's speaking to you or you don't listen to him. And then to take up your cross and follow that thing through. To seek after the mind of Christ in the Holy Spirit. To seek after the Spirit's strength inside to give you the determination and the character to do it. Take up your cross and follow Jesus will probably not mean literally giving up your life, but it will mean being obedient. And for that, you need to be praying and listening and discerning what God is asking you to do. And it will mean standing for something, for righteousness, for justice, for mercy and for love against the injustices of the world. And in that, there is hardship. So we need to learn and love the reason we do it. We endure the hardship because it is Jesus we follow and in that is our joy. And that can only happen if we are drawing closer and closer to God. And that is the Lenten journey from which fruit will come as we become more and more like Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins 
and for our fallen nature on the cross at Calvary. Help us to follow in his footsteps, to take up our crosses daily, to nail our own flesh to the cross so that we can deny ourselves to serve others in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Barry, for that word. And as we continue in our service, let's profess our faith together. Though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a slave. He was born in a human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every voice proclaim that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And now we will bring our needs and our prayers to God in intercession. Father, as we come before you approaching the third week of Lent, please open our hearts to reflect, listen and feel your love among us. Dear Lord, thank you for being with us today as we gather together and spend time to share with each other. We pray for our church leaders, Barry, AJ and David, whom have always prepared to love and serve and to comfort us whenever we reach out. May we also give thanks to everyone to prepare the organize the online gathering when we can't meet face to face. Thank you to our families whom we share our daily lives with in good times and bad. We seek strength from our family members, including our extended family in church, to get us through this difficult lockdown time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ever living God, today we reflect ourselves on things that we had done wrong and things that we can do better to make you proud. May you bless our medics and carers to hang in there. Give them strength to both their physical, physical and mental health to carry on with their jobs while we are seeing glimpses of hope. The vaccination program may soon help us to get the immunity to beat this virus. Blessed to the families with deceased and those who are being sick to continue to give comfort to them. May you look after the key workers who dutifully carry out their daily job to keep our society functioning. With the potential of another relaxed lockdown, may you continue to give us wisdom and good judgment so that we continue to keep everyone safe while the economy can slowly start to recover. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for social justice and equalities. We pray for those who struggle financially, the homeless, the asylum seekers, and people who don't even have enough food to feed themselves and their families. We pray there is help coming to their way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jesus, during Lent, may you connect us to this world you have created, connect us to the nature and wildlife, May you guide us to do good, to conserve and love this planet, to live sustainably, to have world leaders to work together on policies to push towards green economies, climate justice and social justice during this critical 30 year time. Before we reach an irreversible situation, may more people realize the extreme weather conditions we are seeing are due to climate change, where we won't be able to hide from. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Dear Lord, we pray for the country leaders. May you guide their conscience that lead to wider good to this country and the earth to make the right path forward. As we are in the period of land, may we always find time to get close to you, to listen to your words and follow your course. Merciful Father, accept this prayer for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now it is a time for peace. Since we are justified by faith, we have a peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Please offer one another a sign of peace. Peace of the Lord be with you. And as we share peace, this is also time to prepare ourselves for communion. So if you have not got your elements ready, this is the time to get ready with your elements. And before we get into communion, we will have our musical reflection. Dear brothers and sisters, I invite you to come around the Lord's table and share from his body and his blood that he has given for you and me. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it, gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and wine may be to us the body and the blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our reason, Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus taught us to call God our Father, so we have courage to say, and so we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one prayer. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. And we continue to say this together. We do not presume to come to this table merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. So the body of Christ keep you in eternal life. Blood of Christ keep you in eternal life.
So let's pray. Almighty God, you see that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so we thank God together. Merciful God, you have called us to your table and fed us with the bread of life. Draw us and all people to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And before we go with the blessing, uh, I just wanted to give a few notices. Uh, there will be weekly meetings as usual. We will meet Tuesday evening, 7.30 for our evening prayer and Wednesday morning for midweek communion at 10.30 and next Sunday again we will meet at 10.30 here for online service. However, looking at uh, the situation where things are changing very rapidly, we will have some updates after this recorded notices and uh, my colleague Barry will be uh, sort of updating you after this recorded service. So thank you once again for being with us. And as we depart, let's go with God's blessing. May God the Father, who does not despise the broken spirit, give to you a contrite heart. May Christ, who bore our sins in his body on the tree, heal you by his wounds. May the Holy Spirit, who leads us into all truth, speak to you word of pardon and peace. And the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>